Welcome back to Close Up. We're about to head into another election year, and Republicans in New Hampshire's first congressional district are searching for a candidate who can take on and unseat incumbent representative Chris Pappas. Easier said than done for the last three challengers who've made the attempt. But new candidates are stepping forward, and one of them is Chris Bright, a veteran and businessman from Derry. Mr. Bright, thanks for joining us on Close Up. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're running for Congress. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, I'm a Derry resident. Uh, I moved here in 2005 after I left the Army. I was a West Point graduate. Uh, I started my career after I graduated as a lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers. I uh, did a lot of geopolitical work around the world, and I finished my career as a, uh, as a team leader within a special forces group uh, leading civil affairs soldiers. I got out. I uh, got a master's degree in public policy, another master's in business from MIT. And for the past 16 years, I've been running different companies. I, uh, I've run large uh, organizations for Fortune 500 companies. And most recently, I've been uh, running a company that I founded, which just this year was named the fastest growing private company here in New Hampshire. Yeah. And, and tell us, why run for Congress? Well, for several years now, I've been watching just kind of what, what appears to be just absolute dysfunction at all levels of government. And I found myself thinking, this is the best we can, we can put forward. And uh, obviously, it's a big decision, and there was a lot to step away from. But when I looked at the, just the environment and, and, and the ability to kind of make an impact, I thought, if not now, when? And, and, and who you vote for matters, and it's important to get the right people that are there for the right reasons and not necessarily for own personal agendas or uh, you know, for, for very specific agendas. And, and we've seen that. And so for that reason, I want to do things differently. I want to get back to representing the people of New Hampshire and trying to get us unstuck. If those people send you to Capitol Hill, what's going to be your top issue? Well, you know, I, I've thought a lot about that, honestly. I don't know if I'm ready to even say that. I think our number one issue is just how polarized this country is. And so, you know, we could talk about a lot of the problems that we have, whether they're domestic or whether they're international. I don't even know how we as a country right now could start having good civic debate until we can learn to talk to each other. Hmm. Here's the problem that no Republican has been able to solve in the first district. How do you defeat Chris Pappas? Well, you know, Chris Pappas um, has voted with Joe Biden 100% of the time now. So I think what voters are going to start to see is this is a representative that has gone to Washington, D.C. and has, design, has decided to align himself with the National Party or with Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer. And I think that voters are frustrated with that. That's one of the reasons I've, I'm running was that I just don't feel like I'm being represented. And so... That in and of itself, I think, is enough of a reason for us to say, all right, maybe it's time for somebody else to come in there and, uh, and do the work. Here's something that has nothing to do with policy, but has become one of the most important aspects of any Republican primary. Are you a 100 percent supporter of former President Donald Trump? A 100 percent supporter? No. I mean, if we're being objective... Uh, I thought he had some absolute great policies that he brought forward when he was president. But the way you lead is also important. And I think that um, you could have a great message, but he kind of fell flat a little bit with some of the tweets and, 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 and some of the, uh, you know, some of the ways that we were trying to get this policy done. But I'll be honest, I think with between President Trump or, or any other candidates that, that are challenging him for that matter, I would fully support Donald Trump against Joe Biden uh, every single time. You're a military veteran, as we discussed. You've stood up for the principles of freedom and individual rights around the world against dictatorships, against mm -hmm. tyranny. So you look at the situation in Ukraine, a country being invaded by sure. an authoritarian country. If you're in Congress, are you still voting to support Ukraine in the form of military aid? I am. And let me tell you why. I mean, both Ukraine and Israel, uh, which is another one that folks are talking about, um, these are two countries that are really strong allies of the United States. And both of those countries didn't ask for what's happening to them right now. And I think that the beauty of the United States is that we are the strong country that can go and be the, the leader of the world to defeat evil. And does it mean that we want to go to war? Absolutely not. In fact, there's a quote that a lot of uh, army officers say that above all else, a soldier prays for peace. And that's true. But we can't stand by and let evil take over, and we certainly can't let them stand by and, and take advantage and kind of repress some of our strongest allies in very key strategic areas around the world. A lot of your fellow Republicans, though, especially those in Congress, are saying that money would be better spent back here at home. 
Yeah, and they have a point, right? And uh, I, I certainly understand where they're going with that. Now, when I say we should support Ukraine, that certainly doesn't mean write them a blank check, right? So uh, w whether it's business, whether it's funding on a DOD program, Whenever there's a lot of money at stake, there's a lot of opportunity for corruption, um, inefficiency. We should still absolutely monitor that. And I do like when different funding bills are kind of broken up specifically. So it gives it, it, gives it more transparency and it allows us to monitor where those funds are going. So if those funds could be put to the right use, then I support uh, the investment in helping Ukraine defeat Putin. Republicans generally believe that government is not the answer. But right now, the market is not working for most people on housing. So what is the solution from a conservative perspective to make housing more affordable for more Granite Staters? Well, one of the things that's driving housing right now is is inflation, you know, um, and so it was a combination of both policy and I think just circumstance. So so COVID obviously wrecked havoc on our uh, on our economy. But then when you overlaid on that, the policies that came in with this newer administration, we saw the price of wood, you know, go up, you know, three, four hundred uh, percent. The cost of, of, of fuel to, you know, supply these homes everything across the board has become inflated. So when inflation is high, the cost to build those, uh, those, those homes goes up, the cost to borrow money goes up, and it just creates these, this situation that we're in right now where New Hampshire folks are we're, we're struggling. Everything is more expensive. To drive those prices down, how, how do you do that though? Absolutely. Well, it's policy, right? We can't just keep spending. And I think that that's something uh, coming out of COVID, I would have liked to have seen that tamp down earlier. I understood when we shut down the government and the entire world shut down, we had to help subsidize people who couldn't, who couldn't make a living during that time. But that needed to end after we came out of the epidemic. And because we didn't do that and we kept putting a lot of money out there, it's driven prices up all around. Let's talk about abortion policy. Obviously, there's a dividing line among Republicans right yeah. now. Some see it as a state issue. Some see it as a purely moral issue that should be decided at the federal level. So where do you stand? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm asked about this all the time. The, the first thing I like to point out to voters is at this stage, abortion is not necessarily an issue that, that I'm going to be able as a congressman to really play uh, a major impact impact on. With that said, the Dobbs decision gave states the right to uh, create policy around abortion at that level. And I'm okay with that because I think when you could start to put policy at the local or state level, it gets it closer to voters and it allows them to be more empowered to play a role in what that policy is. So for that reason, I support uh, Dobbs and, and I support keeping it at the state level. And I'm also okay with the current New Hampshire policy. So I support a woman's right to choose uh, what to do with her body, um, to decide what she wants to do up until that 24 uh, week mark. And then after that, I think that we need to start having some restrictions because it starts to get a little, uh, a little ugly as you get later into those pregnancies. And I think that that's the extreme position is to allow late term pregnancies. In fact, my son, <clears throat> one of my sons was uh, when he was still in the womb, we were told that he was going to have an 80% chance of being born with a birth defect. And we decided to still have that, uh, you know, to move forward with the pregnancy. Now, I'll make that decision every single time, but I wouldn't have wanted Chris Pappas or Nancy Pelosi to have made that decision for me. So it's a very personal issue. It's very divisive. And for that reason, I like it being at the state level. So to clarify, though, if the issue did come before Congress, say a 20-week ban, how would you vote on that? So on a 20 week, 20 to 24 weeks, you know, I'm, I'm open to having a conversation about what that looks like. Um, but I support a woman's right and a family's right to decide what to do up until that point. And again, I'm willing to compromise a little bit on, uh, you know, on, on, on what that threshold looks like. And I would also encourage, you know, like it's not just Chris Bright deciding what that should be. That would be a decision that I would really work the, uh, the district for to understand what our constituents wanted and to try try to bring that and synthesize a, uh, a reasonable uh, you know, compromise to, to a tough issue. I want to quickly get to energy policy here. If there's a new natural gas pipeline that could bring energy into the first district, mm -hmm. would you be supporting it? I am supportive of that, yeah. Um, now, I'm also, I mean, just like everybody else, I care about the environment, right? And I think that we do need to pay attention to energy independence for multiple reasons, both from an environmental perspective and, uh, you know, and from a, a political perspective. But yeah, Energy means lower prices, and, and that's a good thing. All right. Chris Bright running for Congress in the 1st District. We'll see you out there on the campaign trail. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.